time. Good morning, church. Good morning. Great to see you. We have some baptisms to start our service. I can't think of a better way, and uh, I'm fired up. These, uh, these people have come forward, all professing their faith in Christ, and uh, each one has a great testimony. This one's about ready to baptize himself right here. <laughs> Ty is fired up. Y'all know Ty Burns and uh, his amazing family all throughout the church. Uh, we are so thrilled just to have Ty with us. And Ty, it's that time, brother. Are you ready? I am so excited to be able to baptize you this morning. It's my joy to baptize you, my brother in Christ, this morning in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised the Lord. It is warm. Thank you. Thank you, Donald, for doing this, by the way. Unbeknownst to you guys, Donald has been up here for three days because the baptistry sprung a leak. And you all were sitting in water. So uh, it wasn't that bad, but we got it fixed. The Lord was good to us, and Donald was up a lot. So thank you, Donald, for taking care of this, as always. Donald is awesome. Devin, are you ready? Yeah. Are you fired up? Based on your profession of faith in Christ today, it is going to be an awesome day. And I'm so excited to baptize you. And based on your profession of faith in Christ, it's my joy, my honor to baptize you, my brother in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> This is the first, for me, twins today. So we have Bree and we have Leah hiding over there. The Pauls have joined us. They were watching with us all the way over from Germany the last four or five years. And I had the privilege, I believe, to baptize their sons before they went over to Germany. We're so fired up that they're back in town. Are you ready for this? Are you excited, Bree? Yeah, you fired up? All right. Based on your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus, it is my honor, my privilege to baptize you, my sister in Christ this morning. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> It's 
really something special when a family decides, you know what, we're going to make our commitment to Christ together. And uh, we get to do that today. So, Terry, are you ready for this? All right. Based on your profession of faith in Christ, it is my joy, my privilege as your pastor to baptize you, my sister now, in the Lord, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Married in the likeness of his death. Raised to walk in unity of life. Try to get through this. I am too. <laughs> you know what? Here, I'm going to have the microphone just so they can hear this over the street. <laughs> Several weeks ago, Helen Moore came up to me after church and said, I want to be baptized. And I said, Okay, that's great. We can do it. She says, But I have a problem. I have a broken foot. And I was like, Wow. So we, we said, How long does it take you to get that boot off? She said, well, it should be by December 12th or so. And I said, all right, we'll push it out. We'll do what we got to do. It's still broken. And she took that boot off just to get in this baptistry. That's how committed she is to following the Lord of Baptism. That is, yeah, you can clap. Three more weeks on the boot. It's healing good. She came up to me and she said, you know what? I want to follow. I've been a follower of Christ for a long time. But the Lord has spoken to me, it is time for me to leave some things behind. Pastor Matt, I've got some bitterness and some people that I've forgiven that have been tough on me, whether it's friends, family, whatever. And we talked through this, and she said, you can share this testimony that when I go under this water, I am leaving all that behind. And when I come up out of that water, I am a new creation in Christ. The old is buried, and the new has come. fired up and Helen gave me permission to share she is 82 years young and she is doing this so y'all got no excuse now y'all ready you're on the fence now's your time all right Helen Eastmore I love you I love you I, I am so proud of you this, this, is, this is awesome today it is my joy my privilege as your friend and as your pastor to baptize you this morning in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in the Good morning again. 
Merry almost Christmas. Can you believe Christmas is just 13 days away? 13 days. Can you believe it? It truly is the most wonderful time of the year. Who's got their shopping done? Yeah, okay. All right. All right. Very good. Today we talk about joy. Let me have my volunteer come up. Going to help me light this candle. Where's Emily? Here she comes. All right. So we've lit two candles. Yeah, you can give her a hand. We've lit the candle of hope and peace. And today is the candle of joy. That one right there, if you need to hold that to get the flame. There you go. It's a big day for you. Your brother got baptized. One more. That's a new wick, so take a minute. There you go. All right, see if. Let's see if it's. Oh, it's low. Here. Take it. Got it? Hold it there for a minute. Nice. Good job. Awesome. Thank you, Emily. Oh, yes. We talk about joy today. I am so fired up. I love everything about Christmas. Gathering with friends, gathering with family, our Christmas Eve service, keeping the spirit right about this season, the cookies, the desserts, the cookies and desserts, that's right. Did I mention the cookies and desserts? I love everything about it, even those goofy Christmas movies that everybody loves to watch, and some of the heartwarming ones, some of the funny ones, some of the, is your favorite one up there? Is Die Hard really a Christmas movie? I'm not sure. Well, is it? Okay, well, we settled it. You heard it here, folks, right here today. Here's the thing I've noticed about Christmas. The older I get, the more I find joy in watching my kids open presents. All your moms, grandparents, y'all are nodding because you get it, right? You've been there. You see, there's something special. The Bible even says it's more blessed to give than to receive. There's something just awesome and magical when you handle that. You're so excited. You want to give them a present. And like, I'm bad about this. Like, I buy it like in November, and I want to give it to them right then. Anybody else like that? Like, you're so excited, right? We're going to see that today. That's exactly how God is with us. When you find joy in something, it is amazing. They can't hide their joy. It is absolutely one of those things. Just, you can't hide joy. By the way, for those who look close, that's scrapbook. Scrapbook. Just want everyone to. We, someone pointed that out. It is a Yu Gi Oh! scrapbook. And when you find joy in a Yu-Gi-Oh! scrapbook, it is hard to hide it. Think about this. The things that bring you joy are the very things you want to share with somebody else. Right? Your team wins. Big game. You, want to, you don't want to be alone. You want to share that. You want to call somebody up. You have a great day. Something goes awesome. What do you do? You want to share these news. Is it any wonder that God himself does the same thing in the scriptures? In fact, it's almost like he can't wait about the good news that Jesus is being born. He is going to send a forerunner to prepare the way. And that's what we look at today. It's the greatest gift that's ever been given, the incarnation. And here is God's excitement, the hope, the joy he knows is coming. And this is our first truth this morning. Jesus' birth is the source of true joy. Are you lacking joy in your life? Get close to Jesus. Get close to Jesus. This is, it's almost like you can sense his excitement. One of the reasons I love the book of Isaiah is because it talks about this excitement. Remember, hundreds of years before it happens, they're predicting this. And Isaiah is coming along and he is saying, guys, prepare the way. God's promising a time of preparation, not only for Jesus, but a preparation before he comes. And we catch a glimpse of this promise right here in Isaiah 40. Look with me. It says this, the voice of one crying in the wilderness Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. That's powerful. When I read these verses, I can almost sense the joy. That God is so excited to share with the world that was so broken by sin, now there is going to be a way that it can be made right. There's going to be a straightening, a leveling of all things. The, the people will be able, there's no high or low. All these, the glory of God is for everybody. But the key here is the preparation. Don't miss this. If Christmas comes and goes every year and it's a blur, you're like, what? what just happened? Because we didn't prepare. We get so caught up and the wrapping, and the shopping, and all these things. The key here is preparation, like any great event. Think about it in your own life. Let me show you what I mean. Each day, Christmas or uh, Thanksgiving Day, I'm ready 
put the Christmas music out, get the decorates out. Like the turkey's not even in the fridge. You know what I'm talking about? And I'm so excited to go get the decorations out. Actually, my, my family has to find them because I can't find nothing. And they're looking for them. And we got new lawn ornaments this year. This is a picture of, of our, our front yard. And if you notice, each one kind of represents somebody. You got little Mercy sitting on top of Mama on the far right. You got Milo <laughs> being attacked by the dog, which is a true story. <laughs> Then you've got Marin kind of just glowing and sparkly because she's just so sparkly, so much you know, glitter and stuff. And then you've got Big, Big Papa <laughs> over here. By the way, here's a picture of what happens to Big Papa when he's had too much eggnog. Just wanted you guys to know. <laughs> Full. It was great coming home and seeing that. All my neighbors I know, loved it. When I go to decorate, I say, Marin, Amy, can you, can, I'm just going to, just give me a minute. I'm going to go find it. I know where everything is. I'll go get it, I'll get it out of the attic, third floor, I'll go get it out of the garage, and I'll just find something. And then about an hour later, I come walking in all dejected. Said, and they take one look, and they're like, what are you looking for? <laughs> what couldn't you find? And I just politely say, it doesn't matter, because it doesn't exist. I would have found it. Like, somebody broke into our garage and stole all our Christmas decorations, our used decorations, somebody broke in our attic, don't even go, no, 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 you don't even need to look, you don't understand. I have looked everywhere, it is gone, never to be found again, don't even bother. In fact, do we have that actual photo of me looking for it? This is how most men are, if you're honest, and all the ladies are nodding, because I can't see the ketchup in front of me in the fridge, right? This is, they have a gift, it's a spiritual gift, they can find anything. Like in 23 seconds, they come back in, what I was looking for, for an hour. And as I, as I think about this, this is why we start so early, because we love preparing the way. Day one, after Thanksgiving is over, we are literally counting down the clock to the big day. What are we doing? We are preparing the way to celebrate the birth of Jesus. We're so excited about that. The promise in the Old Testament is that the people of God will actually see this preparation take place. See, God doesn't want them to miss it. This is a signpost. He's saying, literally, prepare the way. Make straight the road, y'all. He is coming. All those barriers, all those roadblocks, you don't have to earn it. You can't be good enough. I have taken care of everything. I'm going to put the sins of the world on my son. And before he comes, I'm going to have a trailblazer. And his name is John. And it's going to be a powerful event. Go ahead and find Luke chapter 1. We're going to look here. Fast forward to the New Testament. There's a man named Zechariah. If you're new to the faith, you're just checking this out. Zechariah is a good man. He's now a priest. He's serving in the temple. He's a righteous man. Everybody apparently looks up to him spiritually. He's well respected. And he's in the temple with the rare treat of burning incense. This is a huge honor. He's able to go into the holy place and next to the altar that all these candles are. And this is where we pick up the story. Something unexpected happens while everybody's out back praying for this, right? Starting in verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord appears to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell on him. But the angel said to him, we talked about this last week, Don't be afraid, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. This is huge, guys. This, this is not the norm yet. He will turn many of the people, children of Israel, back to the Lord their God, and he will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people. There's the word, prepared for the Lord. So if you didn't quite catch that picture, Zechariah is serving in the temple. He's going about his duties. Nobody's expecting this. Then the angel of the Lord appears speaking to him. Because he's at the right side of the altar, that's reserved, by the way. That's, I did a whole sermon on that last year. You need to hear it. I won't go into that, but he is rightfully gripped with fear. There is a reason. This is so abnormal, and he naturally has the same reaction you and I have. Every time somebody shows up at the Christmas story in an angelic form, the first words they say, don't be afraid. And remember, Zechariah and Elizabeth, they've been praying for a child, and their prayers are about to be answered. They're about to give birth to a son. They're about to give birth to this son, and they're going to name him John. And the angel says he will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. So clearly this boy is special. Something is different about him, and God is going to use him to bring, what's our word today? Joy 
to the world. Not only to his family, but to us. He is going to be the forerunner to the greatest news that would literally change the course of history. Every time somebody else says that, it's just kind of hyperbole. This is the one time we can literally say this is going to change the course of history. Jesus is about to show it. You can see the connection here between Isaiah, hundreds of years earlier, and here in Luke. The entire world is about to witness this. Something wonderful will happen. There is a joy. And that brings us to the next truth today. It is a joy to prepare others to experience God. Or at least it's supposed to be. How you, uh, how you doing with that? It's a joy to prepare others to experience God. Are we so focused on ourselves? This season, has it been about us? It's okay. No shame here. Maybe it's time to broaden that myopic view right here and bring others into this. This is where we find joy, when we share the good news. Have you noticed that the most joyful people this year are the ones who get this? They're the ones who share in the real meaning of Christmas. They're the ones who you can see it by the way they treat others in the line at the Coles. True story. Or at Dollar Tree, just don't even go. It's not worth it. Right? Or in the drive through when these people are honking their horns, they're getting mad, and they order the food. And right before they get up to the window, they tear out. And you pull forward, and now you've got their order, and it's all wrong. And they look at you like you're an idiot. Just say it, you know, hypothetically. And the, you see it the way people react to that. Burger King over at Holly Springs has got a sign that says, please be patient with us. At least we showed up today. Right? At least they, got, at least they showed up. One or two people, and that's it. Like, where did everybody go? We have... We're the people of grace and joy. We're not supposed to be those angry people. And then it's supposed to show up. We see this. We're supposed to prepare others when we serve others with joy, when we speak to others with joyful words, when we are preparing others to experience and meet Jesus. And we look around and we see how much joy is in short supply. I mean, let's just be honest. There's a lot of people who are miserable. <laughs> they look like a country song, like somebody kicked their dog and baptized them in prune juice and then vinegar and left them, right? That's what, I just, there's so many people that are just miserable. And now maybe they got real reasons. Maybe they're heartbroken over something. Maybe it's a, they got a bad diagnosis. Maybe it's a time of grief. I get it. It happens. Or maybe they're struggling. Maybe they're struggling with sin. We don't talk about that anymore. We like to say, oh, it's, it's our foibles. <laughs> it's our misgivings. No, if it goes against God's word, it's sin. And it will rob you of joy. We've all been there. We know what it's like. So we see this amazing time where John's call in his life is going to bring joy. It's our calling too, by the way, pointing people to Jesus. Zechariah, his initial response uh, is probably like ours. It's a little doubtful. Read with me starting in verse 18. So Zechariah said to the angel, uh, how shall I know this? In case you haven't noticed, I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced. He's nice not to call her old, right? She's a, a seasoned saint. And the angel answered to him and says, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you, to bring you these glad tidings. And behold, you will now be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. Did you catch that? He's like, I, I don't, you know, it seems kind of weird. I don't really understand. And, you know, we're old. She's old. We're all old. Everybody's old. I don't think this, uh, you know, are you sure about this? And it's almost like he said, boom, I am Gabriel. <laughs> right? Just picture that. And, like, and that's his voice. I am Gabriel. Do you know, I stand in the presence of the Most High. Right? Like, the Most High looked at me and said, I need you to take this message down to Zechariah. And Gabriel's, sir, yes, sir. Gabriel always has, you notice he always has the honor of being the one who brings good news. What a cool job. He never has to say, hey, your rent's late. Like, None of that. He just shows up and he says, and it's almost like Gabriel just has this moment where he pulls himself back, like, do you know who I am? I am Gabriel. Nothing that I'm anything great, but I stand in the presence of the Most High. Not a mayor, not a president, not somebody we think is power holder. I stand in the presence of God. And he sent me this message. And you have the audacity to say, are you sure about that? <laughs> so he says, from now on, you are silenced. 
And that caught everybody's attention. He was skeptical, and boom, now we see. Now, fast forward to the birth of this promised boy. Just like we do today, people are gathering outside. They're trying to share in the joy with Elizabeth. The birth is going to be awesome. And spoiler alert, let me connect a couple dots here. If you're new to the faith, I see a lot of new faces. And you may not understand the story, but this is one of the cool things. Here's, here's how this fits together. Elizabeth is a relative of another woman named Mary. Okay? This Mary happens to also be pregnant, also with a boy who will soon give birth, and that boy will be named Jesus. Okay? So Jesus and John, a lot of people say that they're cousins. From the time they were in their mother's womb, they were filled with the Spirit, connected to each other and to God. So the time has come now for John to be born into this world. Look with me at verse 57. Now Elizabeth's full time came for her to be delivered, and she brought forth a son. When her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. So it was, on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. And they would have called him by his name of his father, Zacharias. But his mother answered and says, negatory, he will be called John. Check out their reaction. It's, they're so baffled. They looked at her and said, but there's no one in your whole family who's called by this name. So they look to the, the dad, like, like, oh, she doesn't know what she's doing. Let's talk to the dad, like the dad knows, right? And they look at the dad, and they're making signs to him, and he grabs a tablet, and he says, guys, his name is John. And they're all baffled. So they all marvel at this. Immediately when he did that, his mouth was open, and his tongue is loosed, and he spoke praising God. Guess what happened next? The fear of the Lord descends on all who dwelt around them. And all those sayings that were discussed throughout the hill country of Judea, all those who heard about them kept in the heart saying, what kind of kid will this be? And the hand of the Lord was with them. I love how the message translation puts that last verse. It says, a deep reverential fear settled over the neighborhood. And all that Judean hill country, people talked about nothing else. Everyone who heard it took it to heart, wondering, what will become of this child? Surely the hand of God is on him. Think about what's happening here. When this baby's born, there's that traditional discussion. Who's going to name him? What's it going to be called? And everyone expected, because that's the tradition, you name him after your father or your grandfather. She goes up and says, no, his name's going to be John. Because the angel said this. We miss the significance of a simple word like John. It's not like Bob, like, hey, what's up? My name's Joe. This is a serious name that was reserved for perfect reasons. The name John in Greek literally means graced by God. But in Hebrew, it actually means Jehovah has been gracious or God has been gracious. This name speaks volumes. And we gloss right over. Oh, John, I know a thousand John. No, no, no. The joy that surrounds his life, God has been so gracious to Elizabeth, to Zechariah, they gave him a son. God has been gracious through John's life to prepare the road so that you, 2,000 years later, can know Jesus. He had to blaze the trail. He was the forerunner. And that takes us to our final truth this morning. Our joy comes from the grace of God. God's grace, right? We didn't earn it. Nothing about us. Everyone who gathered here celebrated John's birth. They're sharing in this joy. Little John, he's surrounded by joy. And the minute Zechariah is obedient and writes the name John on the tablet, he's once again immediately able to speak. Notice his first response. It's not, wow, thank you. Or it's like he starts praising God. He is rejoicing. And when word spreads about John's amazing birth and that Zechariah can now speak, everyone in Judea was in awe. And they were wondering what amazing things John's going to accomplish. So let's bring it down into our world. Here's the deal. John's birth and his life was given the same grace that is offered to you today. Not a different grace. It's the same grace, the same God, our same heaven. We can't earn this grace. It is a gift given to us because of Jesus' life, his death. He really did die. He really was buried. And he really was resurrected again. And when we live our lives knowing that, guys, we're supposed to radiate joy. So you know i got to ask, are you? <laughs> How are you doing with that? Right? If you're saved, notify your face. Do, 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 do. Right? Some of us, man, it's not just resting frown face. It's like, I hate you, right? What are we doing? We're the ones that are supposed to be radiating joy. We get this. God's grace, he can forgive our sins. Who does this? Our God does that 
Emmanuel, God with us. People see that, and people should notice, and maybe, just maybe, they will be in awe of the Savior we claim to worship. Maybe they'll come up and say, hey, what's that about? Hey, I saw you making a public statement. It was on the, on the on social media, on Facebook or Instagram, a chat, a phone or something, and I saw this thing, and what's that about? And you open the door, and you're able to talk about it. And you're able to say, let me tell you about the grace of God. He changed my life. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to end a little different. I'm going to let you out a couple minutes early. I'm going to have, uh, Jason, are you closing tonight? You got this? You got the guitar? You good? Yeah, yeah. All right, come on. Do your thing. I want to uh, leave you with a really, really cool story of someone who displays joy. And my point of this story is this. I want you to be asking yourself, what do you do to display joy? Here's a picture right here of a guy named Todd Burkemper. Todd Burkember on the left is six years older than his younger brother, Alex. Okay, you got mom and dad. Here they are. The guy on the far left, Todd, is a good dude. He is a hard worker. He is a go-getter. He is a genuinely a great guy. And he has just built his first house with his own money. Just two years after graduating college, he became a software developer and has his own apps and he does all these designing. And the dream of owning a home became a reality early in his life. And he wanted to give his younger brother a chance to live rent-free with him after his younger brother, Alex, graduated college. So he called up Alex and said, hey, man, why don't you come live with me, little younger brother? Let's have, uh, you know, it's going to be awesome. Oh, yeah, I loved it. They were best friends. They were inseparable. We couldn't wait. So Alex moves in. And then after six months, Todd does something unexpected. Todd goes up to his little brother and says, hey, I need you to start paying rent. Okay. I thought it was rent-free, but Okay. He loved his brother and he wanted to do it. So he did it. He had enough money to, to scrape together to do that. But unbeknownst to the younger brother, Alex, Todd was taking every single rent check that Alex wrote and depositing it in an interest-bearing investment. We find out later that Todd was also adding a lot of his own money to that investment to help it grow even faster. Month after month, this went on for four years. Alex was finally ready to buy his own house. Todd shared with them that he had a secret all these years. The mom was there and the dad, and they got out their iPhone, and they surreptitiously started to record this heartwarming moment when Todd revealed to Alex what he'd been doing. The mom writes this, Although Alex was puzzled when he saw me get my camera phone out, he was even more confused when Todd held up a screenshot of a bank account balance with a large amount of money. And then Todd looked at Alex and said, all this is yours. The heartwarming moment was captured on film. You can see it on the right here. They, he just broke down and cried, collapsed on his, young, on his older brother, bought his house. National news picked it up. Some of you may have heard this. There wasn't a dry eye after she said this. Caught the attention of so many people. You know why? Because joy is contagious. And we need that. The generosity shown by Todd this changed the brother's life. The joy was so obvious. I love that. Okay, so here is your challenge before you go. What is one way you can bring unexpected joy to somebody this season? What's one way? Be big, be small. It doesn't have to be financial. It can be. That's a great blessing, especially this time of year. It could be an act of service, an act of love. It could be anonymous. What is one way you can bring unexpected joy to somebody? Here's a challenge. I want you to pray about it, and then I want you to do it. Don't let yourself off the hook this week. Pray about who you can bless and bring unexpected I promise you, it is so much more fun to watch somebody receive something than it is to be given. That. This is your challenge. In fact, here's what I want to do. I'm going to pray for you in that challenge right now. So let's stand together very quietly, reverently. I'm going to pray for you, and we're going to unite our hearts. And this is going to be our, our closing prayer as we go today. Let's bow together. God, you are so good. Thank you so much for writing yourself into this story to be our joy giver. We love you. We worship you. We bless your name. God, I thank you that you didn't leave us as orphans to just wander around in the darkness, but you saved us from our sin because of your amazing grace. Father, this week, would you give each one of us a divine appointment? Somebody, Lord, would you put them in our path? Let their name or their face race in front of our mind and heart in this moment. Who do you want us to bless? Who can we show and bring unexpected joy? 
who is that person? God, help us not to be content to just sit and soak, but help us to serve you. This is such an awesome season. It's so hard for many. Lord, would you put that person in our path so even we don't miss it? May we be bold. May we share the joy that has changed the world. You're so good to us. Thank you for coming near in the form of the baby Jesus. We love you. We pray in your powerful name always. Amen. Before you guys leave, I want you to go hug some of these people who are baptized today. You find them, give them a big hug. Take a card off of that blessing tree and bless us. Almost all of them are gone. There's a few people left that need to know God's love. All right, this Wednesday night will be our final uh, Wednesday night for the new year. So I hope you guys come and make it awesome. I need to see our leadership team of elders just for five minutes right up here when we dismiss. All right, God bless you guys. I love you. Have an awesome, awesome week. See you Wednesday night.